All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We just thank you for the people that showed up. Thank you for our visitors. <clears throat> we just give you all the praise and glory for everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, Charles, call me. <laughs> Y'all take my pass on. Charles called me a couple of weeks ago. I don't know what we would go do for the night. I was supposed to have done this last month. Then I got down on my back and I just, just did it anyway. But there we go. <clears throat> well, what we was going to do? I said, well, I, I've got several things that I can do, just whatever you want to do. So he called me back <clears throat> was it yesterday, the day before or something. Anyhow, we came up with this. And uh, so if it's a big flop, we blame it on Charles. What? <laughs> I didn't do it. But sustainable bee, uh, backyard beekeeping, sustainable, you know, that's kind of like self reliance. You're kind of, I mean, the definition of that, about as simple as I can come up with, is you're relying on yourself. You ain't got it. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you it. And I kind of call it uh, bee management because bees don't really need to be killed. I mean, bees have been doing what bees do since God created them. And, uh, you know, you, you read and you hear about natural beekeeping. <clears throat> as long as uh, you got bees in a box, there ain't nothing natural about beekeeping. If you want them back to do natural beekeeping, you got to go 10, 15 foot up in a tree. That's natural beekeeping. Uh, my mission statement is produce more honey with less colony. Less work. Well, that less work, that's kind of that's kind of iffy there. Uh, yeah, you know, you got bees, there's work. Now I know when you first start out with one or two you know, colony of bees, your main, I know when I first got started, which was I'm in my sixth year, uh, I hadn't been doing this long compared to a lot of people. Uh, you know, you start out with one or two colonies, and you're, you're, you're thinking, you know, I want to kill a bee, I want to do this. That ain't beekeeping. I, I just tell you that right now. Uh, and I try to tell everybody that when they first get started, you know, your first year, you're not going to get much honey anyway. And that's kind of the bottom line of I probably all of us in here in the backyard tonight. None, none of our big beekeepers are here. Uh, I tell everybody, look, you know, if you start out with one or two colonies, the best thing you can do is learn how to split. Learn something new every year. And that's kind of what I did. My first two years, I struggled. I'll just be honest with you. I'm no different than anybody in this, in this room. Uh, I was losing bees every year. I would, I would split. I would get my numbers up. But what I was doing, I was splitting my production highs. And whenever you do that, your your honey production goes down. Um, and I was getting my highs number, like I was telling you earlier, you know, from February to say June, beekeeping's easy. I mean, you got you know you, you got a nectar flow on everything. They're happy. You got everything's going good. And then comes fall, and you've got you know you got row, you got you got hive beetles, you got. Uh, Yellow jackets coming, you got uh, ants, ants. Uh, you got all these pathogens and stuff that's coming and it, it gets hard. And the best way you can overcome this is to learn how to split. It's a numbers game. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. But anyway, uh, I list some of these people here and I kind of call them mentors. Uh, everything I'm gonna tell you tonight I didn't come up with it. I either read about it, uh, seen it on YouTube, video, whatever. Uh, Megan Milbrook, she's a, uh, the top big gal up in the Michigan State University. She came to uh, it was it was plant years ago. Yeah, about yeah. two years ago. Mm -hmm. She was one of the keynote speakers. I right. the Japanese lady from yeah. Tennessee. Mm -hmm. 
She's got a lot of material online about sustainable beekeeping. Uh, go to her website, you'll, you'll learn a whole lot. Uh, she talks a lot about sustainable beekeeping, and of course that reduces your replacement cost. You know, if you start out with two colonies, I'll just be honest with you, you're going to lose them. I'll just tell you right now, you're going to lose them. You start out with two and lose three, four, you know, that's before you know it. Like, where do you go? And it's just, it's in their DNA, bees die. Uh, oh, uh, Tom Seeley, I got him listed down there sick from the bottom. He's a top guy at Cornell University up in New York. And he's got several books out and what, what they do, they study a lot of animal behavior. And he uh, specializes in honeybees. And uh, Cornell University owns Arnott National Forest, which is just north of them. It's about 40,000 acres, and that's where he does all of his study. And uh, even in the wild, uh, they, they, they found out that uh, longevity of, of honeybees in the wild is about three and a half years. And forever, there's maybe one, one swarm out of three that even survive. So that's the reason uh, you know, they'll, they'll, have, they'll throw multiple swarms a year, and that's the reason. They, they, you know, that's how they keep their species going. Uh, Walt Wright, he was a Nassau engineer. He got into beekeeping in his 50s. He was from uh, Tennessee, and that's where I learned my nectar management. You, you can produce more honey In order to produce a lot of honey, you cannot let your swarm, like your hive swarm. Uh, Charles, he's big into catching swarm. He loves catching swarm. Well, I'm just the opposite. I love making bees. I can make bees. I don't like catching my own swarm. I like catching your swarm. <laughs> That's what you know, I really enjoy. You know, I don't know a whole lot about beekeeping, but I, but I, can, I can produce bees and I can produce corn. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I but don't know how to catch them. I have to learn how I learn. You go kill a lot of bees before you learn how to keep them alive. I'll be honest about that. And I'm not trying to scare any of y'all lose people. We've all been there. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you, I'll show you a way in a minute how to get around. Maybe we should raise puppies. So <laughs> yeah, let's just give up the whole bee thing and raise puppies. <laughs> uh, Bob Denny, he's a big uh, packer producer up in Georgia. He's right, right on the uh, Georgia, North Carolina line. In fact, he's got a lot of out, out yards in North Carolina and Georgia. But uh, if you get on YouTube, he's probably got 100 videos. Uh, all these guys, most of them has got videos, some of them has got books. But, uh, I learned a lot about apiary management from him. Barnyard bees over in Georgia, uh, he's the one that came out with these two frame nukes about four years ago, maybe five. He's got a ton of videos. Uh, now he's, uh, he sells bees, you know, he no nukes, packages. He's got his own store there. And, uh, where is that now? Chatsworth, Georgia. Uh, you can learn a lot about making splits using these two frame hoops. Uh, Mike Palmer up in Vermont, he's right on the Canadian border. He's got, he goes to a lot of these big beef conferences and he'll give speeches on, uh, on how, he, how he manages his, uh, and how he got started in the beekeeping. A lot of good information, but he's got a lot of videos on overwintering nukes. And I got to thinking, you know, here he is almost in Canada. If he can overwinter nukes there, I can overwinter nukes here in Alabama. Uh, so that kind of got me interested in that. Joe May up in Indiana, he's a fat B-man protege out of, out of Georgia, but he's nothing like 
He calls himself a skinny big man. He's about that big around. He's a good guy. He's got some good He stuff. does. He's got some real good uh, videos on how to make queens. I, I make queens, but the non-graphic way. I haven't got he's, any graphic. He's way. got a lot of common sense. He does. He like he does. does. Him he and, uh, anybody can understand. Him and Barnyard Bees. He's a protege of uh, Fat B Man over in Georgia. I mean, they, they don't talk above your head. You can understand what they're talking about. Uh, Mel Discord, he's out of Michigan. He's another, he's the one that came out with this OTS queen rear. And basically what that is, uh, he'll take, he notches his, his frames. He'll take open brood and his hive tool and he'll notch it. And he'll put several notches and well, he'll select you know, three day old or less eggs and he'll notch them. And those, and those workers will start pulling the queen cells down from where he notched. Uh, I use that sometime. Isaac Hopkins, I was gonna use his deal this year. To, I was, right now, well, up until now, I've been letting my hives make their own queens. I do splits, I let them make their own queen. This guy, he's from England. He came out, he wrote, first wrote about this back in 1911. Now, when he actually done it, I don't know, that was the first uh, material written. They still use his, his way of queen rearing over in England, even today. Uh, it's kind of, it's almost like draft, grafting. You still got to do the timing. Uh, you can't start it, go on vacation. You got to stick with it. Uh, I was going to do that this year, but I got down on my back, so I had to kind of... Brother Adam's over in uh, England, a uh, buck fast Abbey. He's a monk. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. That's kind of what we're going to do tonight, his queen management. Uh, of course, Tom C., we talked about him. George Emery, up in Maryland. Uh, he's dead now, but he started the Montgomery County Big People Association in Maryland. Uh, years ago, and he he wrote uh, a lot of articles every month in their newsletter, and he kind of goes by science. Uh, there's a USDA uh, bee lab in America, not far from where he lived, and he kind of went. His beekeeping was kind of like what you know what they were what they would recommend, but <clears throat> I put down our pink pages. If you'll go online. And put in George Emery paint pages. They've got every one of his, all every one of his writings that he done every month. Now he's kind of a he's kind of a type of guy that if you don't do it his way, you're not Mickey. So you kind of kind of overlook that. But he's got a lot of good information. But you got to respect somebody like that, that that has that you know that type of drive that he thinks he's really doing right. You gotta respect it, but kind of overlook, because uh, he, he would get on to his members about not showing up, and I mean, it's... Does that work? Huh? Does that work? Because we have to send them all a notice next week. Uh, <laughs> all right, there's two, the two most critical factors that you control. Number one is your knowledge, and number two is your management skills. These control everything else. Now, when we, <clears throat> some of you know, some of you probably don't know, I wasn't looking to get into beekeeping. Uh, I retired from the railroad in, uh, in uh, 2016. We'd already built our house in Casada, our retirement home. And uh, we found this place up in Weoka, almost in Coosa County. And the guy, the previous owner was a beekeeper. He had a huge beekeeping. He had like 250 hives. <clears throat> when we bought the place, there was 10 hives left. And he gave it to him. He wanted. He wanted. He wanted the next person to come in. Hopefully, would would, would kind of take over what he was doing. And you know, I told him. I said, you know, I don't know nothing about this. I knew two things about beekeeping. Number one, they stung, and number two, I like honey. That's all I knew about beekeeping. Uh, and I asked him uh, one day. Uh, was kind of walking over the property and all. And, I asked him, I said, look, what, 
if you, if you bought a place that had, had bees and you didn't have a clue what you were doing, what would you do? He said, uh, first, I would read all I can. Get, get your hands on all, everything you can get your hands on, read it, and then I would join your local bee club. And he said, hey, dude, you got to do, you got to, you got to do one or two things. You either got to, you either got to make honey or you got to make bees. You got to make up your mind. Of course, I didn't understand what he was talking about. I didn't know, didn't know the questions they asked. But anyway, uh, we joined the, this, this bee club. I mean, we sat in the same place y'all are right there, brand new, didn't know nothing. Uh, so when we signed the papers, I had 10 hives, so I would be happy. I didn't have a clue of what I was supposed to be doing. So he told me, he said, look, your first year, just let these, and this was like, when we signed papers, October, September, September. So it was too late in the year to do anything, really. And I noticed the hive, they were kind of cocked, the top was cocked like that where he had it in it. And, uh, of course, I didn't know the time, that's where it was, but later on I figured it out. So the only thing I'd done that winter is I just closed the top. That's all I did. Well, come spring, we lost four hives, we went down to six. Uh, of course, you know, you move into a new place, you're trying to fix it up like you want it. So I spent the next two years kind of fixing up the place like she wanted it. And, uh, didn't have a whole lot of time for the bees. I'd go walk through there every now and then just to make sure they were still in the same places. <laughs> That's what. That, that was, that, that was. But anyhow, I started buying books in the wintertime. And I counted the other day, I was standing there and I had, I counted all my hat. I got 40 books. Some of them were written in the early 1800s originally, all the way up to today. Uh, I know back then they didn't. Beekeep like we do, man. It was they had their problems. I don't know if I could have beat beekeep back then. They didn't have no fancy suits, nothing, no fancy stuff we got today. Uh, of course, they didn't have the varroa mite, but they did have a trachea mite that came along and just wiped them out. And you know we don't hardly hear about that today. Um, but anyway, uh, knowledge being number one, read all you can. Uh, get online, and you got to be careful. There's people out there that's been beekeeping for six months that's put videos out. I mean, so be kind of careful. Uh, and I would recommend learn learn something new every year. Don't try to learn it all at one time. Like what I did, you know, I learned to, to split. Uh, then I learned. Uh, I learned how to split. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it'll come to me. All right, and uh, of course, you control your management skills, and that comes from knowledge. Uh, Bob Benny, his big saying is, is uh, up in Georgia, you know, beekeeping is 50% science and 50% art. And the science comes from your books, your knowledge, uh, whatnot, and your uh, art comes from experience. And experience comes from your mistakes, a lot of. Uh, you're gonna, you're gonna wonder. And I did this, you know, you go down there and then things ain't going your way, your bees are dying or whatever. And you, and you see, you know, I'm going by a book, I'm going exactly what the book said. Well, the bees didn't read that book. I'll just be honest with you. They don't, they don't read what we read. Uh, anyway, there's three kind of beekeepers. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder just what happened. I was number three for about two years uh, before I finally got an act together. And I kind of call that the BCD. You know, we've all heard of the CCD, but we call it collapse disorder. The BCD is beekeeper collapse disorder. That's the reason, you know, we've had one-on-one classes here up until the pandemic. 
this thing, this one would be slap full. You would have folks, you would have folks lined all that wall, back in you know, there's chairs all the way to the door, all the way back to the wall. For six weeks, it would be like that. You might have two people. And that's fine. You know, be keeping it for everybody. And it don't take you long to figure it out. It, 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 once you get it. And, and, and go with them classes. Even if you don't, you know, if you don't get your beat, it's a good thing to do because you, you hear about what people has gone through. You know, it's, it's a lot. It's a learning curve. It's almost like trying to bring water from a fire hose. You got all this information coming at you. The process and it takes three to five years before you start really understanding where you're really what, what's going on or did for me. Our best beekeepers plan ahead, you're prepared. And this is something else I recommend. Make a seasonal to do this. The way you manage bees, February, March, and April different from May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January. All four of those seasons are different. And the bee world, you know, their their spring starts in February. February, March, and April is the spring for, for May. And then uh, May, June, and July is your summer. August, September, October is your autumn, and then November, December, January, but that's the months you don't really do that. That's when you get your books out and you start reading and you start planning on what you want to do next year. <clears throat> Make a floral calendar. Once you learn what the bees, floral, floral is really important to what, what you know what bees are doing inside that hive. There's my first thing I look for is the maple plant. And where I'm at is the first week of February every year. And if you'll write it down, if you'll write these four, you know, find you, find you a maple tree. Uh, a lot of times these shopping centers will have, have these maple trees that plant down in the little islands and plain where you park on. <clears throat> anyway, find you a maple tree. And when you see it blooming, like, Charles does the same thing. We feed pollen in the, in the winter. I'll put the pollen feeders out in October, about the middle of October, you'll start to see them go to it. And I'll leave them up all through winter. And you'll see them out there. On a 45 degree day, they're out there all. We didn't do that when we first started, right? No, I didn't know I, anything about it. I didn't know. But, but you well, always hear about the people that should serve. They also need pollen. Uh, pollen is a protein. They'll go to that pollen all winter. But we had such mild winters. Yeah. See, we're, 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 we're subtropical. In other words, we've got mild winters and hot summers. We're subtropical. So, you know, you get online and, and, and look at a lot of these videos, they're up north, out in California, Oregon, you know, and they'll talk about wrapping your hives up in the field. Now, you can get them. You can wrap them up it's a lot of moisture now. Or down here, it's not the cold that kills our bees, it's the moisture. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Anyway, uh, anyway, maple tree. Maple park blooms the first week of uh, uh, February at, at my location. Now, I'm at a higher level elevation than we are right here. So if you're in, if you're in Wetumpka, Hillbrook, Prattville, Montgomery, it may be a week or two before that. You'll see your our, we, we have a bunch of them at work that naturally grow on. And ours are about second, maybe third week of February when they start. So, anyway, as soon as that starts blooming, that's when they they start raising the brood. I mean, they, they'll raise a little bit of brood during the winter. I mean, they'll have a little spotty like that. Uh, in, in your, in, in, you know, November, December, January, you'll find a little bit of brood because it don't get cold enough here that it'll stop the queen from laying. 
So there'll be a couple of turnovers during the winter, but come February when that maple bloom, they'll stop taking your pollen. You, you find that out? I'm about to, about to, I'll leave my pollen up to the middle of February, but anyhow, about the second week of February, they don't, they don't touch it because maple is, is putting out pollen. And that's brood food. Pollen is brood food. Uh, they, it gives a little bit of nectar, but not much. And that's when I start feeding sugar syrup. I put out one to one sugar syrup uh, as soon as that maple blooms because the maple don't give out enough nectar. They, they give a lot of pollen, but just very little nectar. So I'll start feeding one to one sugar syrup uh, as soon as that maple blooms uh, up until say the first of, uh, about the end of March. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit here too because you gotta be careful because if you don't, if you don't watch it, it'll make them swarm. Uh, but I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the next thing I look out for is the uh, dewberry bloom. And the dewberry is gonna bloom about four weeks before your nectar flow starts. And once you start, like I said, when I, was, I, meant, I started to say, but once you start writing these dates down after about three years, you'll start seeing a pattern of what, of what blooms in your area. Being that the, the, uh, the uh, dewberry bloom, once you see it, it's about four weeks before your nectar flow will start. And then your blackberry bloom will bloom about two weeks after that. And that's when I start doing my splits. That's usually around first week of uh, April. Cause my, my nectar flow, I use the 20th of April as my target date. That's about, this year it started like 15th. So, you know, I've, I've got these target dates. And see, that's something else. It's not, it, there's, no, there's no literature or anything out there that tells you or this date do this, and this date do that, and this date do that. Uh, so I've got target dates like, uh, well, I'll get that in a minute. I, like, I'll start making my splits as soon as that blackberry bloom, which is about the first week of April. And, uh, and then my main nectar flow, my main nectar flow is a tulip pop. Find your tulip poplar. They, I don't know if you know what it looks like, but the leaf looks just like a tulip. You know, you know how a tulip uh, flower looks. That's where the leaf looks, and it'll have a it'll have a yellowish green bloom on that thing. It'll be that big. And they can almost fill up uh, a tonic super just with one bloom. That's how much they nectar them things give off. So that's my next thing. I look, that's, when I see that bloom, I know my nectar flow. Of course, you can see the bees. You know, as soon as there's a nectar flow, you see them bees just, I mean, they got, some, they got a place to go. They, they go. Uh, and the last thing is work with your bees. I know when you first start out, I, I remember going through my 101 class six weeks and I get this certificate with my name on it that says I'm a beekeeper. Well, the bees didn't know I had that certificate. So, you know, first time I open up that hive and I've got, you know, I've gone through the class and I'm gung-ho and <clears throat> holding that hive. And the first thing is now what? You know, it's just like you just lost everything you learned. But uh, anyway, it'll finally come back. And once you start reading books, and I like that school, you know, English and science wasn't my thing. I just, it just, I passed it, but how, I don't know. But math and history, I mean, I didn't have all I had to study on that. I was just, it just something, I know that's a weird combination, but uh, those two subjects I excelled in. And I like history. Uh, now I've, I've had cattle. <clears throat> we've raised beagles. We was in the field trial. Uh, what else we had? Horses. 
Yeah. Horses, mules, yeah. yeah. dogs. Anyway, we've had about chicken. We've had about everything. And I always, I always go back and read the history. You know, I always like to go back. You know, and how it. Now I raised Texas Longhorns when I had a cow, and they, you, there's a big history on that, all the way back to the Civil War. And, and uh, I, I like, I like American history. I like. And some of the book, uh, beekeeping books I got is a, a American beekeeping, a beekeeping in America was one of them. And they would go back and tell how bee, you know, bees, I didn't know, honeybees weren't native to the United States. They were brought over, they finally, they came over on the Mayflower, but they put them on the Mayflower, but they didn't make it, they didn't make it over. Uh, the first honeybee didn't make it to America to the colonies until 1622. And that was the German black bee. And I know you mentioned the African bee, they were just as mean as the African bee. And that's what they had over here. And uh, the Native Americans, they didn't have a word in their vocabulary for honeybees, so they called it the white man's fly. And uh, well, a little question. If there were no bees at that time, then what pollinated all the plants? Butterflies. Butterflies. Yeah. Yeah. Anything that crawls across, mm -hmm. you know, honeybees aren't the only. You got bumblebees, you got uh, uh, lizards. Yeah, Anything that crawls across a flower. They say we're going to starve it if, if you don't have honeybees. That is not No, the case. it's not true because our diet is wheat, corn, potatoes, and none of those need. Bees pollinate, those are wind pollinated. So, so they uh, didn't have money? Uh, the Indians didn't have money? No, their sweetener was like That's the reason they started growing sugar cane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, their, their sweetener up until, up until that time was uh, maple syrup. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but anyway, uh, work with your bees. Uh, know, you know, know your pattern, your floral pattern. Once you, once you figure out why you're doing what you're doing, the what and how will follow. Uh, I mean, you know, once you figure out, you know, why am I out here in, in July and August sweating trying to get my bees ready for April? Well, that's really when your bee season starts, is August and September. What you do in August and September determines what kind of bees you go have in April. And we all want alive, healthy bees. That's that's our number one thing. And without that, you ain't gonna get no honey. When you yeah. get that first bottle of honey, you're gonna be so proud of it. Oh, yeah. You don't even wanna eat it or let anybody touch it. <laughs> all right, we all have beekeeping potential if we do these. If you read and study, observe your bees and pay attention to what they're doing. They're the best teacher. Your bees will teach you everything you wanna know. If they're surviving under your management, then you're doing good. But if they're not, they're trying to tell you you might want to change the way you manage. Uh, make a point at joining a beekeeping club to learn more. You will be better off than if you merely put those bees in a box and let them do their own thing. Uh, that's very true. Uh, you know, beekeeping ain't like a like a birdhouse that you put in the backyard and hang it up. You go out there in the morning with your coffee and say, hey, I got a bird going in out of my birdhouse. So the beekeeping ain't like it. So you gotta, you gotta, uh, you gotta stay with it. Uh, successful beekeeper. Uh, success is relatively, relative and individually fine. At the most basic level, you can keep, if you can keep bees, keep them alive, Enjoy how you're keeping them, and you're successful. You know, if, a, if, a, if somebody's got two hives, and all they want is a quart of honey every year, and maybe enough to give to their neighbors. Uh, they don't go out there and hardly do anything to their hive. And then you got this one that's got 25 hives, and you know, he's out there working, producing a lot of honey. And which one's successful? They both are. Because the one's got two out of it, it, they're doing exactly what he wanted them to do. So, you know, you ain't got to be, you don't it's have to. It's not a contest. It's not a contest. You don't have to try to outdo everybody. It's whatever, whatever, whatever 
your end result is. Uh, and it's going to change. Uh, I know my first three years, I changed something every year. You know, I was, I was going down this road, and then I decided I'd go down this road. Uh, but whatever your end result is, work towards it. Work towards your end result. Uh, there's two things that are certain in beekeeping. Number one, you're going to get stuck. I mean, there's, and the longer you wait, the more, uh, I guess the more worse it's going to be. Uh, I've, had, I've seen some videos and I've read the books and uh, like that Michael Palmer up in Vermont, you know, he recommends him and his whole family to get stung at least once a month. That been a big decision. Uh, and number two, your bees will die. It's in their DNA. There ain't nothing we can do about it. Uh, like I said, you know, yeah, even out in the wild, at the most, they're going to leave for three and a half years. I'll get into that in a minute. I'm kind of, kind of, kind of overcome that. But anyway, these three procedures right here is what I implemented in my, in my management skills. And I've seen a big turnaround. Uh, number one is treatment. I don't know how you feel about treatment. Uh, you know, the role Mike's been here since the early 80s. We've had our best. Researchers and scientists on it ever since. And they have learned more about it. They, you know, at first they thought they were sucking the blood out of the bees, and they just found out about two years ago that it's actually they're sucking the fat out of the bees. Uh, so, but I use I use uh, oxalic acid, essential oil. Right now, University of Georgia, Michigan State, State, Penn State, Florida, University of Florida, I think Auburn's in on it. The USDA it won't come out with a new label to put on acidic acid. Now, we just started using acidic acid what, two years ago. It became illegal. I think they've been using it before then. They're illegal in Canada and other places in Europe. They've been using it for years. Uh, they're trying to come out, USDA is going to come out with a label of how, how we should be, how much we should be putting in our hives. Right now, right now it's uh, one gram per box, I think that's what it is, which is, uh, it's supposed to be one gram per half a teaspoon. Yeah, something like that. I don't know why it could have been maybe a quarter of a dollar. Anyway, it's a quarter of a it's poor. One, one is important because I, I, I overwhelm with two beats and I put a, I put a half a teaspoon in there. Anyway, they're trying to figure out how much, because oh, it's not working. That, that one gram per box isn't working. So, I think it's Penn State. They done, they treated their hives every day for 30 days. And what they were trying to do is what kind of effect that's got on the bees. And what they've done, they would do that, and then they would send it off to the lab, and they can test it. Uh, and they found out that it has no effect on the bee as far as health-wise. It has no effect on the bee at all. Uh, so right now, they're saying, they're trying to, right, right now they're saying two grams per box. That's what a lot of them, I know Bob Benny up there in Georgia, that's what he's doing in his apron areas. He's putting two grams, which would be a half a teaspoon per, per brew box. And he said he says he sees a, a big difference. So, you know, even now, you know, and growing and, 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 and the big thing is they're trying to figure out how to kill an insect that lives on the insect. That would be a good one. So, you know, the way it looks right now, we're gonna we're gonna have a rope. But tree, you can knock it down a little bit. Uh, and, and even tree, to give you an example, 
uh, drones. You know, your drone may be in your box tonight, and tomorrow it might be in a, in a native high, uh, in a tree somewhere. They don't go the same high every time. So and they may be in your neighbor's box. Uh, drones, even even in your own neighborhood, they'll go from, from high to high. They don't. They ain't. They not like uh, the forgers and all. They'll drill too, but the drones, they just, so if they go to a native hive out of a tree somewhere that had not been treated, it's got varroa and all kind of pathogens, that guess where it's going, you when you hide. So even you tree, even though you tree, and then, and then they, you know, they recommend once you tree to uh, check it to see how many, how many you got. No, it don't matter because if you ain't got none next week, you might have some more. You got, you know, you got all, and then, like, if out in the wild, you got a native, native uh, colony out in a tree, and if something happens and they die, well, guess who's going to go out there and rob that? Your bees. If it's in your, in your two mile or five mile radius, they're going to go out there and they're going to rob that, and they, anything that was in that hive is Treating uh, next thing is feeding. Man, this is this is where I feed a lot, especially my, my uh, boots. And I, like I said, I'll start feeding as soon as the maple tree blooms. I put out community feeders. And I'm feeding my hive, my hives, native native uh, bees. If I've got neighbors, I do have a couple. Probably Charles uh, Jeff's. Bees are coming over there anyway. I'm probably feeding everybody for that time. But feeding, uh, not only sugar water on syrup, but pollen. Pollen is very, pollen is a protein. Sugar syrup is the carbohydrates. Uh, I, I put out four feeders. I, I'm with you, Sean. Well, for me, that's what I eat. Oh, for me, is probably the top seven right now. Oh, for me, Probate. We have to go through a 10 pound bucket and a couple of weeks to eat. Well, mine don't seem like to do that. that but anyhow, I'll take mine. It's your four inch pipe. Yeah. Uh, I built four inch uh, PVC. Uh, they're about probably what, eight, ten inches long. And Charles puts, uh, what's that you put on in here? Just like a down spout for a drum and you have to pipe. use a scheduled 40 PVC pipe for your, for, for your drain pipe. I'll put a, 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 a sweep on mine. I, yeah. yeah. Mine, it's got, a, it's got a sweep on it. Yeah. And it's kind of pointing towards the ground, which keeps the water from, from getting in there, but also it keeps the other deck. There are a lot of ways you can feed them. You don't even have to have that. No, you can uh, you take a lid yeah. off the box and put a bottom board down and pour it out on the bottom yeah. board, put the lid on it and just keep it dry. Yeah. 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 There's all kinds of ways. Or at the top of the hive with a dry, you know, they make feeders for sure water where they you can put dry stuff in it too. But uh, that's just one little thing we found somewhere. I hang those up around mine two or three places. I got four out. Seem to do good on I have to go out there once a week. I'll put it like two cups at a time in there. And uh, I have to go out there about once a week once they start on it. And, uh, but he had that sweep I put on there. What it do to keep the water out plus to keep the yellow jackets out. Uh, honeybees can hover like a helicopter. You know, the yellow jacket can't. they got to come in straight and length. So if you've got something they can't, can't get up, they won't, they won't get in there. Uh, get out of Queen, this is the most important right here. I'll fix it again. So, anyway, uh, young Queens. Since I've started making my own Queens, I don't have a Queen in my apron it's over two years old. Years ago, before Baroa, all these other diseases, Pathogens we got, you know, old timers. They had hives. They would go out there in the fall and rob them. That's it. That's all the work they do. 
Well, oh, that put some uh, <clears throat> queens, and I'll get it in, in that in a minute. So we'll fix to get down here in the bottom, the heart of this thing. Uh, I'll leave that there. All right, treatments. This, this is what I do. I use essential oil. I give them three treatments, seven days apart. And uh, I do a treatment of essential oil in September. And the reason I do that, oxidic acid does better in cooler weather. Uh, you don't have a lot of brew. What's that about that? I like hard brew. But anyway, uh, you need your bees to be. You need you need the bees to be in the cotton in your in your hive. Uh, you treat in the summertime. I don't start to treat in August, but you got your foragers out. It ain't getting treated. And what it does, it y'all know what I'm saying? It's a brand new, I'm sorry, it's a crystal. It's a crystal. And you put it in this uh, vaporizer, vaporizer, and of course, this is run off with a battery. You stick it in your hive, and it turns that, those crystals into a vapor. It just fills your whole hive with that vapor. All right. It's a wood bleach. Yeah. Uh, after about Three five minutes, it turns right back into a crystal, but it's on the bees. It's done coated your bees, and they're going to lick it off, and they're going and they're going to move it around all in that hive and whatnot. Uh, so that's when you need most of the bees in your hive. So I'll I'll use my acidic acid in November again. Uh, and, you know, most of you know they're going to be. Can't use it below 37 degrees. Anything above 40. What I usually do is 40 degrees. If it's 40 degrees above, you can use it. Uh, and then I do a Nozema treatment in October and March. What kind of oil do you use? I use uh, Spearman, Wintergreen, and Tea Tree. And that's you uh, Propane. Right here. <laughs> you can use a handheld propane potter. Yeah. All right, Barola. Now you can get on. You can get on. None of this stuff is a secret. You can get online, Fat B Man, Skinny B Man. Anybody's got this online. You can use a glass blender. Don't use the blender out in the kitchen. Go to Walmart, buy the cheapest. Now make sure it ain't plastic because that essential oil that you do. Make sure it's glass. Go to Walmart, buy the cheapest glass of a blender you can find. And in that, put one cup of water. Two teaspoons of wintergreen. And one teaspoon of uh, spearmint. Did you taste it? I'm scared. Uh, also, one teaspoon of a teacher oil. And you blend that for five minutes, no less. You got to multiply. You you got what you're doing, water. you're multiplying. You're getting air mixed in with it. And it'll stay for about six, it'll be good for about six months. But anyway, blend that up for at least five minutes. Go over, but no, no, no lower. Five minutes, and then you pour that into a half gallon glass and pack. Get you a half gallon mason jar or whatever, uh, and then fill it up with water. Fill it up the rest of the way with just plain old water. Now, how many hives you got? Alright, for every uh, yeah. see, I, I mix a gallon, I mix five gallons at a time. I use one cup of uh, it. How do you use it? Spray it, feed it, feed it. You put it in a feeder, a top, a top feeder. I'll show you. Now. 
just that, or do you mix it with the sugar water or anything? That. I either put uh, one cup or uh, production high, which is my eighth frame high. I put a cup in there and I do it seven days apart. So they drink it? They drink water sugar water a day. Yeah. That right there probably goes fast too. Alright, young queens. Alright, here we go. Young queens. This, this does the hard right here. I'm going to show you all how to do splits. Uh, this came from Brother Adams. He's over, he's the monk over at Buckfest Abbey over in England years ago. These are his exact words. I put it just like he put it in his book. A queen coming out of her first winter will be at the peak. Have y'all got a point? Oh, yeah. yeah. I've got a point. A uh, queen coming out of her first winter will be at the peak of her productivity in the spring to follow. In other words, the queen that you're raising this month, she's going to take a new through the winter. She's going to be in her most egg laying capacity come next year, come next <clears throat> next uh, spring. Number two, never make use of a young queen in a production hive. That's where I went off for about two years. I was, I was splitting my production hives, trying to increase my hives. Number one, it's going to reduce your honey. That year in that hive. <clears throat> and number two, they're probably going to supersede it later on. I couldn't figure it out. Why not really? I just replaced the queen. I let them raise. Uh, what I do, I take the old queen out, let them make their own queen. But then later on in the fall, they were superseded, I think. So anyway, he says never use a young queen in a production hive the season they are born. In other words, the queens that are born this year don't put them in a production hive until next spring. Use only in nucleus colonies for the old winter. That's what I started doing that and it's true. And young queens are essential to ensure safe wintering and for building up strong colonies in the spring for nectar and pollen gathering. That's very true. Alright, after all that's been said, number four, if at any time a colony is queenless or in possession of a failing queen and a reserve queen in the previous year is exhausted, make use of that new. In other words, if you got a, let's say you got a, a production colony that's gone queenless somehow, you don't have a queen for last year that you can put in there, by all means, you should have a new queen this year. You've got a high fill. That's what that means. Uh, and raise your own locally adapted queen from the hives that excel in your area and survive in your bench. <clears throat> when I first uh, got those 10 hives, you know, I told you I lost a bunch of them. I went about two or three years with the same queens, same genetic queens. And, uh, my bees were getting mean. My bees were. My colonies weren't producing the honey that I thought they should be producing. So I got on the phone. Probably April, my first time. Well, I got in my beekeeping magazine. I went through there and found every queen producer in the state of Georgia. I wrote it down. There's eight of them. So this was about the first of April. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to have to do something. I've got to change the queen. So I started calling her out. Don't have any to. Next one, grab, 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 grab. And I finally got down to one. I mean, the time I needed six, so I went ahead and ordered those. 
10 o'clock the next morning, you pee his nose up in the driveway. Swap, you know, I done swap those out. Uh, so come June, I started calling these producer, and sure enough, they had planes in England. Uh, anyhow, I bought, I wound up buying like 20 planes that year for four different producers, all of them Italians. And I've done that because of the genetics. Other Italians there from different producers. So that's what I'm that's what I've got in my apiary now. But I'm starting and I can see a big difference. I mean it calmed the hives down. Uh, but anyway, I go through the winter. I have I used to have about 25 to 30 production hives. And of course Come fall, uh, I guess for oil mine, uh, there's about 30 different diseases that come from a bulk of oil mine. And just for oil mine, they, there's diseases they, they produce also. Anyway, yellow jackets, I lose three or four pot, uh, colonies, yellow jackets every year. So I would, you know, I'd have 25 hives, then I'd get down to 16. Next year I'd build back up, and I'd get down to 10, 12, whatever. It'd feel like I was just spinning, spinning, spinning. So anyhow, over these queens, I've changed my whole operation. I stood there one day looking at the people. So I, was, I said, you know, there's got to be an answer up here somewhere. So I started pulling some of my old big books out and written back early 1900s, 1800s. And the way they managed their bees back then, we lost all that stuff that we had that ain't talking about. Uh, so I kind of started, and Brother Adams, with his queen management thing, I, I, went, I went that route. Uh, and then that was some other way. But anyway, this is how I go through. I've got a new yard, I've got a production yard, I've, I've got 10 production hives, and that's all I want. But with those 10, I can produce as much honey as I was with 25, because of my management of that chain. Uh, and new beekeepers, I make you some, learn how to make those. The first year, you're not going to get any honey anyway. It's a numbers game. You've got, you've got one, you've got two, and I hope you don't lose my bit. Uh, from my experience, uh, you're probably going to lose one, and the other one's probably going to be so weak. But if you'll take a split, I'll show you how to do it. Uh, have y'all got a minute? What do y'all got? Eight, ten frame? Eight. You got eight? I got a hard long high. You can do the same thing in the eight frame that I'm fixing to show you that I do on my new pen. I go through the winter five over five. I got five frames. Usually my brood is down here, and this will be mostly honey going through the winter. Yeah. <clears throat> I've started then. You know, I told you earlier, our biggest thing in the wintertime is uh, moisture. And I was having that trouble. I didn't. You know, before I started making these, this was my configuration. I come, uh, you can see it on the lid. Oh, yeah. yeah, where it turned black. Yeah, it would, it would just be moisture all up in on, on the top, on the top. Now, also, uh, in the wintertime, these are my these are my top feed. This is how I feed them for my sugar syrup, uh, my essential oils, and whatnot. Now, in the wintertime, I tell you, I run. 505, I'll turn this over. I'll put a four pound bag of, now even though they've got honey up there, I'll put a four pound bag of sugar. You know, to go two dollars and something a bag, all that is an insurance. Just in case they run out of honey, they've got this sugar. And I'll turn this over. I put the, I put the sugar on the back side, and I'll turn this over. 
slide in here. These and all. Alright? Or if you don't want, if you can't find the queen, shake the bees off. Just put that frame, frame of brood in there. And what I use, I don't use sheets of, uh, I do sometimes, I've done gone to this. They'll draw this out quicker and they will a full sheet of wax. They'll take it and they'll draw the prettiest uh, foundation out that you'll ever see. All this right, right here is fishing line. I learned this from Joe May, Chris Cross, his thing. Anyhow, you put that frame in here, and you put either a solid sheet of uh, wax, or you can put a, a star in here. That's all you got. You got one frame of beef, all you just put in. Why don't you go in here and you look for another one? Same thing, you're going to put it over here in this one. What I'm fixing to do is make make two splits but I won't have three columns. We'll still have the queen in this one. Alright, once you do that, you're gonna have a lot of times what I do is may not even put one of these in. Depends on what I find up here. If I find uh still got some uh, honey and pollen, I'll put it over here next to it. So what you'll wind up doing is that you'll still have your five frames here with the queen. And you may have one left over up here you can use it somewhere. So what I'll do, put this one back together. This is one, this is another, this is another hive that's got the queen in it. And I'll take and move it somewhere in. Anywhere you want. You can put it right here if you want to. But turn it around. Dude. And you know, you always hear make splits. You always want to take more uh, frame of beads and shake in there to make sure you've got enough of these. Well, how many is enough of these? I don't know. Y'all know how many enough of these is? They just said enough of these. Well, if you take this one, you move it somewhere that's about to clean it, and make sure, I usually use, I, I save all the, the cap room to put in here. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Man. All right, you got two. Two frames of these is all you got. You got one here and one here. So you, know, you ain't got very much investment in it at all. You, got, you took two frames of, and, and then, if, you know, like I said, if you want to use honey or you can put this in there. All you got is you just got a, a one frame of these investment. That's all you got. Take this and put it where your mother hive was. Now what's going to happen if you move this somewhere else? All your forgers is going right back here. There's your enough bees right there. So you got your you motor. Be surprised how many forgers are going to be out there flying around. Yeah, they come around. Don't back put it there. there. Most of them and cluster. And most of them that's in this colony are going to go right back. There. That's the only place they know to go. They don't know to come back here. Even though you moved it over there, they don't know to come back here. So what you have got is another queen in here. You've got the nurse bees that's still in there, but you've also got cat brood that's going to be emerging over the next two two weeks. So this is this colony's going to be okay. Now, if there's not a nectar flow on, and only if you if you wait and do this as soon as the uh, blackberry blooms, which is you know, where I'm at, she's about the first week of April. About two weeks before, or a week and a half before, my neck and neck flow start. But there should be enough honey in here in, those, in, the, in, the, in the colony to feed them up to that point. So they'll start, you know, they're going to, well, you ain't going to have a whole lot of forages anyway. You may have to feed it. But that late in the year, I don't really worry about that too much. I just kind of watch it. So, anyhow, you're going to have all these foragers coming back here. Now, a forager will convert back to a nurse bee. Uh, it's whatever the colony needs. You know, it's, it's whatever they need that day is what those bees are going to do. Uh, and then I'll close this up and we'll out and watch it for about three days. If you see more bees going in, in this side than you do this, do that for about three days. It don't look like they're equalizing. It's 
swap them around. And after about the third day, they should start to start to be equalized. And what you do, you're going to leave one of these, one of these where the mother hive was. The other one start moving six inches every day. Come back the next day, maybe six inches. Put it where we want to put it. Now you've got three hives. Have one. Now you've got four. All right, that's going to take. How far away can you move this where it reaches? Anywhere you want to, but how 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 tall it is? That depends on how your anchor is set up. Uh, I mean, if you've got mine, mine are all six foot. You know, I can put, I usually put about four hoops on on a stand. Okay. Uh, but I've got stands everywhere. I've got some behind me. I can take this, put it wherever. If you leave it on this same stand, you can leave it right here and turn it around. Okay. And instead of the entrance going that way, have it come this way. Back to go back here. Um, and now start, start moving about six inches every day to get it to where you want it. Uh, now, four days later, I go back and I look, I pull out my frame that had my eggs on it. And you'll start seeing queen cells. Anything that's already capped, take your hive tube and scrape it out. Maybe you use an uh, egg that's too old. Uh, what you want them to do, they want, you want them to use a three-day or less egg. And, you, and you'll see some, some of them, they'll, they'll be queen cells on both sides. Some of them, most of them's going to be open. That's the one you want. But, but if you do find one that's closed, go ahead and take it out. Um, and then go back on the seventh day and see how many queen cells you got. Make sure you got Now if you don't have, like if you find queen cells that are capped, but you don't see none that's open, by all means leave out this cap. Because you won't have a queen. Uh, so I go back in our seven days, see how many queen cells I got. Sometimes I'll take out, you know, there's, I'll probably use, I'll leave four or five in there, but there's more than that, I'll start going in there and just taking some of them out. And then on the 30th day, come back to see if your queen has mated and laid. <clears throat> I usually make up about 10 of these at a time. You know there's nothing 100% in beekeeping. There's nothing 100% in agriculture, period. I don't care if you got cows, chickens, goats, grape, if you got corn, cotton, ain't nothing 100% in agriculture. So if you make, let's say if you make 10 of these, and you got seven or eight of them that's got queens in their land, call that, call that 100%. Because there's birds out there that like Likes bees. There's windshields that likes bees. Caught in a long hive got killed. So the earlier you do that, the, the greater chance you've got of uh, producing a good queen. The later in the year, like now, the chances start going down. Uh, they're just because you got you got more birds out there because they're out there hatching. Got uh, if you live around the water, you got dragonflies, they love bees. They'll, they'll take out a bee and a queen and a heartbeat. So the later in the year you, you try to raise your queens, the chances drop. So even at 80%, if you get even at 8% you know, in, in April, uh, that's good. That's just one way I do it. I know it's going to be 730. Uh, I got one more way if y'all want to show it real quick or I'll put one in it right here. But, uh, whatever y'all want to do. Y'all good? Y'all work? That's just one way I do it. Now, if I don't want to make, if I don't want to make that many,
Come back in here at the same time. Blackberry blooms. Go over here and set your top one over. What you want to do, what we're going to do here, we're going to make this. We want this one here to make it clean. That's a walk away split. Kind of sore. So what I'll do, I'll go in here and I'll find about two, two frames of open brew, like we talked about the first, first time. And you go have, you go have, probably brew both of them. So what you want to do is put all your cap brew in the bottom. Go through there because you want your queen to start in there also. And you ain't got to look for the queen. You can. Uh, Best, well, the best way to do it is bring an empty box with you. A brand new empty box. And uh, take, take both of these off and put that brand new one here. And start going in here and just shake it with Look, if it's a cap brew, put it in this bottom. Same thing, same thing. You ain't got to look for one because you're shaking all the bees down here in the box. What you want to wind up with is most of the uh, cap brew down here and the open brew up here. From all of your open brew up here. Yeah. <coughs> Clay excluder. I don't use clean excluder except for this right here. Put that on there. Now we didn't have to look for the queen. We shook all the bees, so we know she's down here. We don't have any bees up here other than open brood or whatever we, whatever we can do, you know, play house and hunting, whatever. Put that on there and leave it on there for 24 to 48 hours. What's going to happen is <coughs> your uh, nurse bees are going to come through this queen excluder and they're going to get on this brood. They're not going to leave, they're not going to leave brood open. That's why Let's say you're in bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, somebody knocks on your door, and you open it up, and there's a baby. Like you go grab that thing up, and you go bring it in the house, and you go take care of it. If you open that door up, and there's a 13 year old mild teenager, it's going to be a whole different story. So that's kind of like what these uh, nurse bees are. They're going to come up through this, and you leave it for 24 hours. There you go again. I mean, I always say, you know, put, you know, put a flame of bees in shade. They're gonna, they're gonna put. You know how many bees they need on their frame? That's how many they need. You know, let them do the work. You're letting the bees. You're managing the box, but you're letting the bees do the work. All you're doing is keeping the queen out of that top box. They'll bounce. So if they come back either the next day or. You know, if you want to leave it two days, that's fine. Don't remember how many days you leave it. Y'all heard of the smell grow board, double screen board? <clears throat> that's a double screen board. It's got a screen on both sides. It's separated by three quarters of an inch. So right now, as long as you leave this like this, they're, uh, they're queen right. They've got a queen. <clears throat> uh, Come back 24 hours later, take this off, put this uh, double screen board, and there's an entrance. Okay. You'll have these coming out this way. These are still going to be going in and out that way. Once you put this on here, as soon as you put this on here, this right here becomes pointless. It's pop. They have no point. And the reason that uh, snail growth works, you know, bees communicate by their antennas. Front, front legs and their antennas. They can't touch each other. That's when you've got a screen on both, both sides, and it's three quarters of an inch in space. They can't communicate. They can't. But they still got the warmth from this, from this bottom coming through the screen to the top. So they still got the warmth. Put that on there, they're queenless, and now they're going to make a queen up there. 
because of just pain points. <clears throat> you can either uh, leave it like that. A lot of your queen breeders, this is what uh, a lot of your people that sell moots, this is this is the system they use. But they'll, they'll also use it on <clears throat> eight and ten frame box. You can, you can do the same thing. You can either sell this moot. You know, after 30 days, or the same thing, after four days, go in there, make sure you don't have any cap clean cells, take them out if you do, as long as you've got some open, go back seven days later, see how many clean cells you got, um, close it back up, come back on the 30th day, see if she's come back and laid, if she has, <clears throat> take this, just like we've done a while ago, take this runner right out, do it somewhere else with the queen, drop this down, and now you've got two. Instead of three, like the main ball go, or you can set it. You can, uh, you know, give her a chance to lay for about 21 days, see what kind of pattern she's having. You sell it, give it to your friend, give it to your enemy, make a friend, or whatever. Uh, that's the two ways that I'm right. That's what I'm doing right now. I wanted to get into queen cell, making some queen cells to work still letting them make their own queen with the queen cell. Uh, that saves you about two weeks of time. Because, you know, when they make their own queen, you know, you're looking at 30 days before she comes back and starts laying. Then you're looking at another two weeks before her progeny emerges. So maybe you know, you're looking for a month and a half. Yeah. Uh, two months. So it, it's a it's a it's a long process doing it that way. Uh, but I tell you, you'll learn more about bees working these moves. Now, my production hives and Jill City. Once you make a maneuver, but what I do is go in there and reverse my boxes about the end of February, as soon as they move up, get you a 60 degree day, you know, you'll have 60 degree days all winter long. You'll wait and, and I know a lot of you, a lot of you books will tell you, don't go in your hives until the temperature gets 55 degrees at night. That's that's eight. That's too late. Cold weather don't kill you babies. It's the moisture that kills you babies. And there's not enough brood in there that time of year. Uh, it's going to matter anyway. So, in the February, I reverse my, my, my brood boxes because most of them don't move up anywhere. They had not, I don't reverse them. They hadn't moved up yet, I'll wait a week or two. If they still hadn't uh, moved up, I'll, I'll actually go in there manually. Put them down there. Put the put the empty ones up here. And once you do that, and you go back there about two or three weeks later, about the middle of March, get your honey super on there. You're through. That's all you do. All of my work is right here with me. From first of April to November. This is where my work. That's all I got, guys.